be opening your Bibles to the book of Philippians, the New Testament book of Philippians. In just a moment, we'll look at chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. But before we do that, let me just say what a joy it is to be back. Over the last few months, I have logged more miles and slept in more Hampton Inns than any person in the history of the world. From Fort Lauderdale to Winnipeg, all kinds of churches, audiences, banquets, and events and conferences. But I have kept my promise. I told you the last time I preached before I left that wherever I would go, I would take you in my heart. And I have done exactly that. And boy, it is really good to be back. So let's pray and get to work. And now, Heavenly Father, Grant that we could see Jesus in just Him. And would you forgive the sins of the one who speaks? For they are many. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said. The large box sat unexplained and unopened in the corner of our living room for weeks. It appeared sometime after Thanksgiving. Unlike the other boxes near the Christmas tree, this one bore no fancy wrapping or pretty ribbons. It was as tall as I was, which isn't saying much. I was only four years old. The box was taped shut, tightly shut, else my brother and I would have opened it. It bore no name of giver nor receiver. All we could do was ask about it. My mom had no explanation. Oh, it's just something your dad bought for Christmas. I think she thought he was taking advantage of the Christmas season to buy a gift for himself. If anything, she assumed that he had purchased an outboard motor to go on his boat. The box was big enough to contain one, and he had always said he wanted one. Boy, were we in for a surprise. On Christmas morning, 1960, while my brother and I scampered about the living room playing with our new balls and blowing our new horns, my mom noticed the still unopened gorilla of a box. Jack, she said, aren't you going to open the big present? My dad could no more keep a straight face than he could walk to the moon on a moonbeam. He began to smile. His eyebrows arched like little rainbows. And he gave my mom a Santa sort of twinkle. And he said, that gift is not for me. It's for you. My brother and I stopped and looked, and Dad winked at us, and we looked at Mom, and she was looking at Dad, and we knew something fun was about to happen. (laughs) 
Mom stepped toward the big box and Dad grabbed his eight millimeter camera. And we boys scurried over. The moment became part of the Locato family Christmas lore. Mom pried open the top of the nondescript box and she looked in. She reached in. She reached arm length in and could pull out nothing but tissue paper. One armful after another. In the film that our family loved to watch, rewind and watch again, Dad says to her, keep digging, Thelma. <laughs> and the image begins to shake as Dad begins to giggle. What is this, she asks, still digging and still pulling out paper. Finally, she reaches pay dirt, a box. She pulls out the box and opens it. Another box, and then another, and then another, and then another, until the smallest of boxes is produced, a ring box, Open it, my brother and I say to her, but she doesn't have to open it to know what's in it. I had no idea why a ring was a big deal, but she did. And she looks at the camera and says, Jack. And that's when the film stops. I learned a lesson that day, not necessarily about rings, but very much about this, that a remarkable gift can come in a very unremarkable package. It did that day in the Locato house. It certainly did that day in Bethlehem. God, within the womb of a teenage girl, divinity sleeping on the hay of a manger. The hope of humanity surrounded by donkeys and sheep. Who would have thought? No one expected God to come in the way he did, but the way he came is every bit as important as the fact that he came. The manger is the message. At least that was the point of the Apostle Paul. Paul. Now, there's an interesting name that doesn't get mentioned very often at Christmas. We talk about the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel of Luke or the prologue of John or the narrative of Mary and Joseph or the angels and the shepherd. But very seldom do we mention the old reformed Pharisee, but maybe we should because his words on the incarnation and exaltation of Christ are as poetic and beautiful as any that you will ever find. And they are in a book called the Philippians, written, called the Philippians, because it's written to the church of Philippi. And so in the heart of the letter to the Philippians, we find the heart of the gospel. <clears throat> Beginning in chapter 2, reading verse 5 through 11, Paul says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, the apostle here is not writing a Christmas sermon. His purpose is far more mundane. He's really trying to resolve a conflict between two ladies, one by the name of Syntyche and the other by the name of Eodia. Their names appear later in the epistle. Their names are ancient and strange, but their problem is not. They can't get along. And so the apostle admonishes them to have the same mind, he says, be of the same mind in Christ Jesus. And as long as he's admonishing them, I guess he assumes I'll admonish the whole church. And consequently, we have this beautiful four-chapter epistle written to the church, specifically to the two women, but written to the entire church. And in the heart of the epistle, there is this, the heart of the gospel. Some historians think that this was originally a song. And this may be the earliest of songs that were ever sung in Christian gatherings. Still others think, no, it's probably a liturgy that was cycled among the churches for churches to read out loud as a common reading. And then there are others, and I kind of like this thought, that think, no, the apostle here takes on the pen of a poet. He was prone to do so, right? Read 1 Corinthians 13. is such a picture of his poetry. Maybe he was reducing all of the gospel down to verse that could be memorized and recited and passed on from family to family. If so, then the apostle is the Advent's poet laureate. Was it a liturgy? Was it a song? Was it a poem? We don't know, but we do know. It is a beautiful encapsulation of the gospel. The apostle begins with this, and if you like to fill in the blanks, here's your first one. The declaration. The declaration. He says that Jesus was in very nature God. He's talking about prior to Bethlehem that Jesus had every attribute and benefit of divinity. He was timeless. He was boundless. He was limitless. The Scripture says that all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. From heaven's perspective, every rock, every tree, every planet deserves the stamp that says, made by Jesus. Everything that was made was made by him and through him. He gets credit for everything. He gets credit for the whirlpool galaxy. It contains 300,000 stars. Jesus did that. He gets credit for our son, our son that is so larger than the earth, one million times the size of the earth. If the earth were a golf ball, it could fit inside the sun as many times as a golf ball could fit inside a school bus. Jesus did that. Jesus made it all. He simply spoke he declared it by divine fiat, and it happened. And he can call the stars by name, the Scripture says. He can fold up the stars like a Bedouin would fold up his tent. He made it all. He was in very nature God. This stuns us. But what really rocks our world is not the declaration, but this, the incarnation. Here it comes. He... Speaking of Christ, God, he made himself what? Nothing. He emptied himself, or other translations. He made himself nothing. He made himself hungry. He made himself small. He made himself dependent upon legs, larynx, lungs, he made himself dependent upon a mother's milk. 
He made himself nothing. When he was tired, he was really tired. When he asked, how long must I put up with you? He was really frustrated. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He really wanted an answer. He made himself nothing. He took on human form. He divested himself for a time of his divine nature and took on human nature. He said, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. In other words, I speak only as God reveals to me. He made himself dependent upon the revelation of God. And if God did not reveal something to him, he, like we, was left with no answer. An example of this has to do with the second coming. He said, on that day, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In other words, Jesus Christ confessed he did not know. He divested himself of divine knowledge. The one who made everything for a time made himself nothing. And the apostle says that Jesus did not view his equality with God as something to be grasped. Something to be grasped. This is an interesting phrase. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the Greek Bible. It describes Jesus' reluctance to take advantage of his heavenly status. A loose translation might be, he did not throw his weight around. He refused to demand special treatment. He did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited or boasted about. When people mocked him, he didn't turn them into stones. When they spat on him, he didn't boomerang saliva into their faces. When people called him crazy, he didn't strike them blind. Just the opposite. He became obedient, Paul says, to death. Even death on a cross. He was at nature God. He made himself nothing. He became obedient to death. And as if that's not enough even death on a cross. I'm not sure we can fully appreciate like the Philippian readers could that statement. They lived in the Roman Empire. And they understood that death by crucifixion was reserved for the lowest of the lowest class of people and the most hardened and despicable of criminals. It was regulated only by the morality of the executioner, and you know there wasn't much morality there. The one being crucified was tortured. He was whipped. He was often impaled. He was nailed to a cross. He was stripped naked. And he was left to hang in a public place, not in a private place, but in a public place so people could mock him and fathers could point at him and tell their children, don't grow up to be like that person. He became a public example of what good people do to bad people. Jesus humbled himself from the point of being the one who made creation to the point of being obedient unto death, yes, even death on a cross. It cannot be stated too often or too clearly. That was God on that cross. That was God who took the nails. That was God who felt the spit. That was God who felt the spear. That was God, how far he would go. He made himself nothing. He submitted himself even to death, even death on a cross. Why would he do this? Dr. Maltz helps us find an example. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a prominent plastic surgeon who tells a story of a lady who came to him for help 
Her husband's face had been burned and badly disfigured when he tried to rescue his parents from a burning house. He failed in his rescue attempt, and he assumed that God was punishing him because he failed, and he sequestered himself and, and, and refused to come out into public. And so the wife went to the doctor. The doctor said, oh, I can help him with the advances of plastic surgery. We can restore his faith, face. And she said, well, he won't talk to anyone. So I'm wondering, would you do to me what the fire did to him? Would you so disfigure my face that when he sees my face, he sees a semblance of his, and maybe he will let me back into his life? Well, the doctor refused. But he demanded an opportunity to visit with the man. And so he knocked on the door of the man, man's house. He said, I know you're in there, when no one answered. I'm Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I'm a plastic surgeon. I can restore your face. Still no response. And he said through the closed door, your wife came to see me. She wants me to disfigure her face to look like yours so that you will welcome her back into your life. And after a few moments, the doorknob turned and the man opened the door. And he began to receive treatment and actually began a new chapter of life, all prompted by the incredible love of one who would become like him so that he would turn back to her. God did that for you, my friend. God did that for you. You have hands, he had hands. You have a neck, he took on a neck. You have cranky neighbors, he had cranky neighbors. You have cold winters, hot summers, he felt them all. Why? So you would know he knows what it's like to be you. He became like you with the hope that you would trust him and become like him. But Paul doesn't stop there. The declaration and the incarnation is intended to lead us to this wonderful exaltation. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. So the one who went low is now made high. He's no longer in the manger. He's no longer on the cross, and he's no longer in the tomb. But now he has been made high. God raised him up. He has been promoted to the highest place. No place is higher. No place anywhere in all of history, in all of the universe. No place is higher. Jesus outranks every president, every king, every CEO. Every other throne is paper mache and doomed to pass. Every other prince is an imposter, but not the throne of Christ and not the prince of peace. God gave him the name that is above every name. <laughs> Names carry clout. If someone were to say, Queen Elizabeth is here, we would all turn. If you were to have a piece of paper signed by John Kennedy, you would put it in a safe place. Names carry clout. But there is only one name that will cause every knee to bow. And that is the name of Jesus Christ. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There are some people on our planet right now who refuse to bow to the name of Jesus Christ. They mock him. They think the thought of God becoming flesh is absurd, and they renounce their need for a Savior. And they even cast aspersion on anyone who would believe in Christ. They are self-sufficient. They are independent. They are self-made and self-reliant. Ask them to bow a knee before Christ, and they will call you crazy. They will laugh at you. But hear me today. They will not laugh forever. 
A day is coming when their knee will bow. A day is coming when your knee will bow and mine. Some of you have never bowed your knee to Christ. You never have. Many of you have, but there are some of you. People don't know it because you look so nice. Here you are in church after all. You pay your bills. You don't hurt people. But the truth of the matter is you don't worship Christ. You worship your career. You worship your savings account. You worship your reputation. You worship what you can drive or, or eat or wear. God bless you, but you're worshiping such a wimpy deity. Such a wimpy deity. I would, ur- I would beg you, with all that is within me, to worship the only one who is worthy of worship. You are setting yourself up for disappointment because that car is going to wear out. And that reputation is going to disappoint you. And someday this body that looks so beautiful in your building today, listen to me, it's going to get old and the hair is going to fall out and the belly is going to get big. (laughs) You worship something that will die And your joy is going to die too. For your own sake, worship Jesus Christ. Worship the one who has the name above every name. Bow your knee before the one who is the only true king of the universe. All of life comes down to this. Worship him now so that when we all worship him then, we will be glad we worship him first. Because everyone worships him eventually, but those who do so reluctantly on the day of judgment will do so with regret that they didn't worship him here. Worship him. Bend your knee before him. Someday every person will. (laughs) The politician, the preacher, the businessman, the red carpet superstar, the street corner panhandler, every knee will bow before Christ. And every tongue will confess Christ. Hitler will confess Christ. Idi Amin will confess Christ. Satan and his demons will confess Christ. Everyone will. Every tongue will worship. Every knee will bow. Yours will. Mine will. But we don't want to wait until then. Advent reminds us to worship him now. And so the beautiful message of Paul here is the message of incarnation and exaltation. God became flesh, but now he has been raised to the highest place. Which of those two messages did you need to hear today? Please be reminded of the incarnation. He became like you so you can become like him, so he can redeem you and take you into an eternal home. He can help you face today's problems. If he can make the universe, don't you think he can make sense out of your life? Go to him. You do not have a God who cannot understand you, but one who has been tested in every way, just like we are, yet without sin. And so you can approach the throne of grace with boldness. Or maybe you needed to be reminded of the exaltation of Christ. You're a good person, but you need a king. And you're not a good king of your own life. And I'm not a good king of mine. We all need a common king. That's what's going to make heaven heavenly, is that we'll finally agree who runs the world. Why don't you let him run your world today? And don't underestimate the beauty of a common package. Because within a common package is a very uncommon gift, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Hear our prayer, O Father, as we request that you take the words that your Scripture gives us and let them sink deep into our hearts. Do not let the devil come and snatch them. We pray, Father, that what you wanted to teach us today we would receive and that teaching would change us, please. Thank you, Lord, for these reminders, for your love, for your power, and we worship you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. 